Good morning, good day, and good evening to everyone. Dear participants, welcome. Let me begin by welcoming all of you to celebrate International Women's Day with the Common Fund for Commodities today on the 8th of March, 2022. We have prominent speakers and guests with, here, with us today, and we look very much forward to the coming hour. To increase our reach and presence in uh, the CFC member countries, we are using the Zoom platform today. And I think, and, and I hope, but also think that many of you joining today are familiar with the setting given the, the past two years. Before I proceed any further, just quickly allow me to introduce myself. My name is Eva M. Johansson. I am a Senior Technical Assistance Facility Manager with the Common Fund for Commodities, and I will be guiding through, through the coming hour. For this coming hour, I just have two very quick housekeeping rules I would like to share. So first of all, since we are in, in the Zoom platform, please mute yourself if you are not speaking. And later in the hour, we plan to have a question and answer moment. Um, so please make note of your questions and we hope that we will be able to pick them up after the presentations. I would now like to start by inviting the managing director of the CFC um, to give his welcoming remarks. Ambassador Sheikh Mohammed Bilal was selected the managing director of the CFC in December, 2019. Prior to this date, Ambassador Bilal served as ambassador of Bangladesh to the Kingdom of the Netherlands with concurrent accreditations to Croatia, as well as to Bosnia-Herzegovina. Before that, he worked in various capacities uh, in Bangladesh missions in Washington, Canberra, Tashkent, and Kuala Lumpur. Ambassador Bilal is a member of the board of directors of the Trust Fund for Victims of the International Criminal Court since December 2018. He is also a member of International Gender Champions and committed to the parity pledge of the International Gender Champion. Ambassador Bilal uh, obtained a master's in public administration from the Harvard University in the US um, and a master's in international relations and trade from the Monash University in Australia. Also, he has graduated in forestry in, at the Chittagong University in Bangladesh. So with this, Ambassador Bilal, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. I was not in the know that so my CV will be read out because this is not my day. It's a pleasant surprise. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Distinguished uh, governors and alternate governors, Madam Chairperson of the Executive Board, Her Excellency Ambassador Abba Fatima, members of my team, CFC, members of our CFC families, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are here to deliberate on the theme, gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. But before I introduce our keynote speaker, Allow me to compliment my colleague, Eva Johansson, the moderator of today's event. Allow me first to welcome all our distinguished participants. We are particularly grateful to Ambassador Rava Fatima for finding time to be here with us today. This is perhaps for the first time, some members of CFC staff are also joining along with their partners or spouses. I welcome you all with all the warmth that I can hold in my horsey voice. It is our absolute honor to share next one hour with some of you who are our source of inspiration and vision. Allow me to welcome our distinguished excellencies, our governors, alternate and other dignitaries from across the globe. Our experiences show without any doubt that investments with women are generally more rewarding on multiple fronts. My colleague, Ms. Sonia Timmer, CFC project manager, will present for you later today how we have been investing in developing a robust system to consider gender aspects on our projects. Also, we do our best to encourage women-led projects to apply for CFC finance. In this regard, I would 
also like to encourage you to please have a look at our social media channels as we have posted a very interesting article today with interviews with two women that are leading impactful projects in Rwanda and Colombia. We are also pleased to present to you Ms. Nassim Sultana of Royal Tropical Institute, one of the organizations we are working with for some time and we are grateful to, who will share her insights on how gender lens could help in accelerating achievements of SDGs. Distinguished guests, now it is my absolute honor to present to you keynote speaker Ambassador Rabat Fatima to make her keynote speech on gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. Ambassador Fatima is the envoy of 170 million people of Bangladesh in the United Nations, as was nominated by Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who is known globally as mother of humanity for her generosity and compassion for the Rohingyas. Ambassador Fatima is a career diplomat and prior to taking up her current post, she was Bangladesh ambassador to Japan from 2016 to 2019. Those of us who are fortunate to know her to some extent, we always suffer from a sense of paucity. How she could remain as energetic and passionate at nine in the evening as she was at nine in the morning. With unprecedented passion and devotion for the cause of sustainability, within a short span of about two COVID stricken years, Ambassador Fatima has been serving as the president of the executive board of UN Women, the UN entity for gender equality and empowerment of women for the year 2022. She is also the vice president of the 76th session of the UN General Assembly. In 2021, she served as the co-chair of the Intergovernmental Preparatory Committee for the fifth United Nations Conference on the Least Developed Countries to be held in Doha, Qatar, and as a vice president of the executive board of UNDP, UNFPA, UNOPS, UNOPS. And earlier in 2020, Ambassador Fatima served as the president of the executive board of UNICEF. In 2021, she also served as the co-facilitator of the intergovernmental consultations on alignment of the agendas of the UN General Assembly and ECOSOC, and continues unabated with full speed and esteem. This is only possible when it is no longer your job, rather it is your mission, and you are backed up with a talented team of colleagues that you are truly blessed with. Ambassador Fatima holds a master's in international relations and diplomacy from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Tufts University, United States, and Bachelor of Social Science from the University of Canberra and Australia. Besides, she has served with the Commonwealth Secretary at London as head of human rights from 2006 to 2007, and with international organizations for migration as a regional representative for South Asia from 2007 to 2011, and as a regional advisor for South and Southeast Asia and regional advisor for climate change and migration from 2012 to 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I now give the floor to Ambassador Rava Fatima. Rava Pa, Thank you. Thank you, Bilal. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Sheikh Mohammed Bilal, for your very kind words of introduction. I'm certainly not deserving of all that you have said about me. And I believe the law should be passed to make introductory CVs no less than three uh, lines for each. But thank you very much, Ambassador Bilal. is a dear friend and the admiration is mutual. Excellencies, Ambassador Bellal, distinguished members of the Board of Governors, distinguished guests, dear CFC colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, happy International Women's Day. I'm delighted to join you all today to celebrate the International Women's Day. And I thank Common Fund for Commodities, CFC, for inviting me. Allow me at the outset to pay my humble tribute to all those pioneering women leaders whose courage, commitment, and sacrifice have brought us the rights and freedom that we are celebrating today. I salute them. I also salute all women who are on the front line of the battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. They were the real heroes 
who nursed and cared for the dying and the sick, kept factories and supermarkets running and held together their homes during the darkest days of the pandemic. Bravo to those three women scientists who led the teams that developed the first three vaccines against the coronavirus. I also salute the women leaders, including my own leader, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who have shown extraordinary leadership during this global crisis. They have made sure that all response and recovery efforts left no one behind, especially women who bore the brunt of the pandemic. All these women, the political leaders, the frontline workers, the homemakers, every one of them proved one thing, that no job is impossible for them. That women are resilient, they're innovative, and they are fighters. They stood alongside men in the biggest crisis that our generation has ever seen. And they have proven that there's no such thing called women's work. Women can take up any task and challenge. International Women's Day is an opportunity to recognize women's social, economic, and political achievements, their role and contributions to their families, communities, and to their nation. It is also a stark reminder that women's equality is still a far cry. No wonder that we have to set a date aside, the 8th of March every year, to celebrate them. We need to ask ourselves whether we are trivializing their role and contribution by doing so. I believe that every day is Women's Day for the challenges that we must confront every day, our struggles, our sacrifices, the persistent discrimination, violence, and the deep-rooted inequality that we have to fight every day. Thus, today should be a day to make a renewed pledge to ensure full and equal participation of women in all walks of life, to do away with discrimination and violence. And those of us who have been fortunate to break the proverbial glass ceiling should play our role in making that possible. And I was very pleased to see a good number of women uh, uh, colleagues from CFC here today. So congratulations, Ambassador Bilal, for ensuring gender equality in your team. By speaking out, that is us who have broken the glass ceiling. By speaking out, by being role models, by walking the talk. I'm here today as Bangladesh permanent representative to the United Nations because alongside my fierce determination, I also had mentors and champions in my father, my spouse, my child, colleagues and bosses who supported me and believed in me. And I, we must do the same now. And that brings me here today to celebrate the 8th of March with you, to play, make my pledge, to make my pledge to do my part. Distinguished colleagues, that's enough of my life story. Let me now turn to the order of business of today's event. This year, the theme of International Women's Day is gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. This also fits in uh, very well with the theme of the annual session of the Commission on the Status of Women this year, which starts next week, which is achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs. I shall therefore share, share some thoughts about gender equality in the context of climate change, which is a fundamental precondition for a sustainable future. And there are such important lessons in that, in the overall context of women's role and resilience in the face of such adversities, whether it is climate or COVID. And CFC has an important role to play as well in this endeavor. And I look forward to the presentation to CFC later in the program. As uh, already mentioned by Ambassador Bilal, I'm currently serving uh, as the president of the UN Women Executive Board, which gives me a unique opportunity to see firsthand how gender inequality hampers our journey towards a sustainable future. I'm also serving as a chairperson of the Peace Building Commission uh, as its first women uh, chair. And in the PBC, we advocate for women's empowerment as a key to building and sustaining peace. And finally, I'm also at present co-facilitating along with the permanent representative of Luxembourg, the intergovernmental process of the International Migration Review Forum to produce a progress declaration on the implementation of the Global Compact on Migration, 
which is yet another area where gender dimensions play a critical role in defining progress. I just wanted to mention those three ongoing processes, which also gives me a unique opportunity to contribute to this uh, whole notion of gender equality. Distinguished colleagues, this, today, despite significant contribution to economic and social development, women are disproportionately impacted by poverty. Their efforts are undermined due to cultural and systemic barriers, and their participation in leadership and key decision-making processes is far from equal. The emergence of the pandemic has made it, made it worse. It exacerbated the poor socioeconomic status of women and threatened the achievement of the Agenda 2030. The Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and the, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and other aspirational global instruments. We are only eight years away uh, from 2030, yet only one of the 18 indicators of the Sustainable Development Goal 5 for gender equality is close to target. At the current pace, the gender equality gap is not expected to be completely closed in over 135 years. There is indeed no time to waste. Everyone at all levels must break the bias of all forms of gender inequalities to give women the space they deserve in every aspect of public life, from socioeconomic development to fighting the global challenges such as the pandemic or the climate crisis. As I've mentioned earlier, next week, the world will gather in New York for the sixth, sixth session of the Commission on the Status of Women. This year, the priority theme of the commission is achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs, a very timely and topical theme. We are currently negotiating a set of agreed conclusions to be adopted by the commission, which will determine the course of our actions in the coming days. Climate change and gender equality are closely interlinked and interdependent. Women are more vulnerable to the negative effects of climate change than men, although their contribution to climate change is less. Existing data indicates that 80% of people, 80% of people displaced by climate change and climate-related disasters are women and girls. Women farmers account for 45 to 80% of all food production in the developing countries, yet women constitute the majority of the world's poor, especially in that part of the world. 70% of the 1.3 billion people living in conditions of poverty are women. This factor, coupled with other social, economic, and political barriers, limit the coping capacity of women and makes them more vulnerable to climate crisis. Women are, however, however also better in tackling climate change and natural disasters, especially in mitigation and adaptation. Their indigenous knowledge and leadership in sustainable resource management at the household and community level can provide critical basis for national and global policy making. And we have excellent examples to also share from my own country, Bangladesh. Global efforts for sustainability and gender equality must go together. This is all the more important now as we are trying to build back better and more resilient from the COVID-19 pandemic. Allow me to share a few thoughts in this regard. First, we must ensure a gender equal recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The impacts on the pandemic on women have been disproportionately harsh. Achievement made, achievements made in women's advancement are facing a rapid slide back an estimated 47 million women are likely to be pushed into extreme poverty because of loss of incomes. Women working in the informal sector are the hardest hit. And I know CFC deals with some a large majority of women in that category. Violence against women and girls is also on a sharp rise. School closures have forced nearly 750 million girls to stay home, leading to growing risks of child and early marriages among other abuses. And women living uh, in vulnerable situations, such as on the front line of climate and disasters, are at a greater risk. Concerted efforts are needed to ensure the, uh, to, needed to close the gaps. 
that have been exacerbated by the pandemic. For that, we must ensure that women are placed at the front and center of recovery and response plans. We need new ideas as well as effective partnership and collaboration to address the most pressing challenges that women faced due to the pandemic, such as job and income loss, growing incidents of violence and abuse, among others. We need to bring together all stakeholders, the public and private sectors, NGOs, women's organizations, the international and regional financial institutions to mobilize resources and partnership to support specific programs on skill development and reskilling, investing in gender sensitive ICT infrastructure and supporting increased investment for women in SMEs, especially in the developing world, just naming a few. Secondly, distinguished colleagues, we must ensure gender equal climate change, environment and disaster risk reduction policies. All legal and policy frameworks on climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction must be gender responsive to fulfill the rights and needs of women and girls. All structural barriers and gender gaps need to be removed to strengthen women's access to and control over natural resources and advance their participation and leadership in climate, environmental and disaster risk related actions. This would require a whole of government approach based on the coordination and capacity building of all stakeholders, parliamentarians, national gender machineries, local government institutions, and the institutions responsible for climate change environment and disaster risk reduction. Equally important is to ensure adequate financing to enable gender responsive policies and programs in climate change, environmental, and disaster risk reduction contexts. There are good practices that can serve as good models to follow. Bangladesh, for example, was, was one of the first countries to adopt a climate change and gender action plan back in 2013, nine years back. We have also ensured gender equality and disaster risk reduction. Last year, our Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief, and Relief won the UN Public Service Award for ensuring gender equality in its cyclone preparedness program. However, dear colleagues, policies will not be enough. Those must be backed up by concrete actions and funding from the national budgets on the one hand, as well as international support in accordance with the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. Thirdly, dear colleagues, we must build the resilience of women and girls. We need to prioritize women's economic empowerment to build their resilience, both in the rural and urban settings. Vulnerability of women to climate change is essentially linked to the traditional role as caregivers. We need to take tangible measures to formalize and monetize women's traditional roles as unpaid caregivers. At the same time, women face persistent gender gaps in education, especially in science, engineering, technology. This, as well as occupational segregation, keep young women from attaining quality jobs in the green economy and in climate environment and disaster risk areas. Time has come to fight such gender stereotypes in all its forms and dimensions. We must close these gender gaps if we are to attain gender equality. For access to education, information and skills is key for increasing women's and girls' resilience and also equality. Women also face health and security hazards due to unsustainable use of natural resources and lack of safe water or sanitation facilities. Efforts must be made to build gender responsive infrastructure, including in the context of climate change, environment and natural disaster, in order to enable women to adapt and respond to the impacts of climate change on agriculture, biodiversity, water, and food security. Finally, distinguished colleagues, we must involve business and the private sector. Gender equality and women empowerment is a shared responsibility, the fulfillment of which benefits all. Therefore, the responsibilities to advance gender equality efforts must be shared by all, including the private sector and the businesses. Business must also move from commitments to actionable measures, Due to their unique position at the crossroads of workplaces, supply chains, and communities, businesses have multiple entry points to drive positive change at scale for all genders. 
The United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights provide a basis for corporate responsibility towards that end. There are also initiatives at the multilateral level to advance women's equal participation in economic life, such as Gender Equality Forum, a platform for all, which brings together governments, private sectors, civil society, media, and academia. My Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, at the Generation Equality Forum last year, pledged to increase women's participation in the ICT sector, including tech startups and e-commerce sector to 25% by 2026 and 50% by 2041. Contribution of the business community would be critical in making these uh, commitments a reality. Besides the private sectors uh, also needs to make gender equality a norm in the business and mainstream gender sensitive dimensions across the entire supply chains. They along with IFIs have a critical role to play by financing support to governments and women's organizations to realize the commitments for gender equality. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, let me rest it here. I look forward to hearing the next speaker, Ms. Nasreen Sultana and other speakers uh, from CFC. I actually meant to have this as a conversation, but I realized that I ended up making a statement after all. I wish to conclude by saying that today we face multiple challenges from climate change and the pandemic, an existential threat to our planet and our lives and livelihoods. To protect humanity from this threat, we must build a sustainable future where dignity and respect for all, including most importantly for women and girls is ensured. And this is a shared responsibility for our, all of us. We must make good on our promises and commitments to bring about real change on the ground for the millions of women and girls globally who are being left behind. Our celebrations today will be meaningless if we do not walk the talk and act on our promises and pledges made. I shall rest it here, Ambassador. Thank you very much, everyone, for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Fatima, for your valuable insights and remarks. We will now look at how gender and women's rights reflect in our work in the commodity sector. I would like to invite Dr. Nasrin Sultana, Associate of the uh, <clears throat> Royal Tropical Institute KITS, to tell us more what the gender lens is why it is more relevant to commodities. First, allow me to just introduce uh, Nasrin, Dr. Sultana. She brings an extensive experience in gender as well as livelihood analysis in agricultural value chains, as well as in the ready garment, um, ready-made garment sector, the latter specifically in Bangladesh. Her agricultural and gender related work um, includes the CGIR research programs on livestock and fish and the research program on climate change, agriculture and food security, where she supports the integration of the gender into the research agenda. Nasrin holds a PhD in gender in rural development from the University of Queensland in Australia. And she is moreover a guest lecturer at the um, Kanazawa University in Japan as well as supports the University of Eldoret in Kenya. Key in all of her gender and agricultural work is to train her counterparts, students, academics, uh, professionals, uh, technical specialists in how to integrate the gender and agriculture in appropriate manner. Nasrin, Dr. Sultana, please, the floor is yours. You are muted. You can start by unmuting yourself, yeah. please. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Eva. Um, I would like to start now. Honorable Ambassador and distinguished colleagues, uh, we have limited time, so I will straight start. Perfect, we can see it. Thank you. There. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So we'll start today. Uh, happy International Women's Day. And we'll talk on gender lens approach to development financing. Uh, Eva gave my introduction. Okay, 
So the content of this presentation will be, uh, we will start with the goal, gender equality, and we'll talk about gender equality and gender equity, gender lens concept, why it is important for impact investment, development financing, and how it is reflected in commodity value chain. Okay. First uh, of all, I would like to remind you the ultimate uh, goal SDGs on gender equality has been formulated as achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls with uh, the indicators end of uh, all forms of discrimination against women and girls, eliminate violence against women, eliminate harmful practices, value on paid care and domestic work, ensure women's participation in leadership, access to sexual and reproductive health, equal rights for women to economic resources, promote empowerment through technology, adapt and strengthen policies and enforce legislation. Gender equality and gender equity. These are uh, key concepts, but often mixed up. So I would like to just make it clear again, the differences, the gender equality that is considered different behaviors, aspirations and needs of women and men are considered valued and favored equally. Rights, responsibilities and opportunities do not depend on whether people are born male or female. It doesn't mean that women and men become the same. But gender equity is the process, like it's the fairness of treatment for women and men according to their respective needs. Often, women and men need different treatment in order to receive the same benefits and experience their right. The picture uh, shows here the equality means equal uh, treatment, same treatment for same benefit. And equity means the different treatment for same benefit. So this is very important when we talk about gender analysis. Uh, what is gender lens concept? A gender defines what women and men do, what they have, their influence and the social norms uh, and values that influence these three former areas. The four main domains are intrinsically linked and provide the frame for a gender analysis. So for a key question uh, for gender analysis, we see who does what, who has what, who decides how, who wins, who loses. We see the gender division of labor, access and control, position and control, gender needs, and social relations of gender, which is very important. Why gender lens is important? Gender inequality leads to specific vulnerabilities, especially among women who engagement in unpaid care work, like access to productive resources and lack income, lack of income. These vulnerabilities are a social construct and can therefore be changed through interventions. The social structures also shape how markets, financial markets and investments work. Hence, addressing social structures will not only lead to gender equity, also lead to a change in how markets and investment work. Uh, what is genderless investing? Genderless investing is the inter intentional integration of gender analysis into financial analysis to make better investment decisions and to achieve gender equitable change that benefits women and girls. It also focus on a broad set of potential outcomes. It also referred to as gender smart invest investing. Uh, if we want to understand gender lens investing more, according to the Global Impact Investing Network, gender lens investing comprises two broad categories. One is investing with a specific focus on women with the intent to address gender equity and promote gender equity. Mainstreaming gender in investment decision as a process to focus from pre-investment activities to post-investment monitoring and evaluation. A gender perspective can highlight financial risks, financial uh, obligations, and financial levers for a company as a whole. The first category leads to investment in the enterprises, those women-owned or women-led, promote workplace equity, the enterprises offer products or services that substantially improve women's lives. The second category 
mainstreaming gender in investment decisions, enterprises with vision or mission to address gender issues, organizational structure, culture, internal policies and work of place environment, use of data for gender equitable management of performance and behavioral change and accountability. Financial and human resources signify overall commitment to gender equity. Uh, so gender lens uh, investment, what is the current state? While gender lens investing is booming, but still far from a mainstream, even a mainstream idea. Investors seem uh, still not sure why they would invest from a gender lens because it is not seen as part of their core business. Investors are confused about how to apply a gender lens. They do not see addressing gender equality as an opportunity to both for the performance of the company as well as to contribute to gender equity. So the concern is, since gender lens investing is not yet mainstream, the risk is that that investing becomes a box ticking exercise for companies and might not make the effort to fully understand what gender lens investing entails. Okay, so how uh, gender lens is reflected in commodity value chains? Why does gender equality in value chain matter? or why gender lens is important for development financing, for social justice, for fair distribution of advantages, assets, and benefits, direct link between gender equity and poverty reduction, for business opportunities, the opportunity of serving business women, women as potential client base, improving a company's reputation, for women managers' contribution to profits. So what it is about, how we do, as I mentioned in gender analysis, we see who does what in value chains, who controls what, who benefits, what is accepted behavior for men and women in value chains, who makes the decision. So this is, we see the gender division of labor, gender norms, decision-making and access and control over resources. This is gender lens, but this is not everything. There is intersectionality, which we also need to uh, focus on uh, there are social markers also affect how people are positioned differently in society that include ethnicity, race, caste, disability, sexual orientation, age, gender identity, location. These intersect resulting in disadvantage and marginalization in specific ways. What are the signs that uh, gender uh, in uh, not gender lens is not achieved in value chains? Gender inequality in value chains is visible in differences between men and women in the value of product or value chain node they engage in, the level and distribution of benefits, terms and conditions of employment, competitiveness, capacity for upgrading. Okay, spectrum for gender outcome in value chains. First, we need in value chains, if we want to establish gender equality, first we need to reach to women. So we need more female participant to considering following things like timing, location, inviting both male and female, adapting recruitment strategy. All these can help us to reach to more women. But reaching is not enough. We have to make sure that women benefit. So how, how can we make sure they are benefiting? So value chain development considers gender needs, preferences and constraints, inform and enforcement of rights, raising awareness of unequal access and benefits, incentives for sharing resources in household. So what's the next step? Next step is empowering women. So shifting power relations, which is very important. So then this is a process from reach to benefit to empowerment. So entry point for gender sensitive impact investment for each all three reach benefit and empowerment, all three outcomes can be pursued if it depends on the strategy taken. So opportunities for gender sensitive impact investment at different levels, investment in value chains that provide employment opportunities for women. Investment in business of female entrepreneurs in value chains where women commonly found already. Investment in value chains where men dominate and where existing gender norms, power relations need to be challenged. Capacity development, supporting change in value chains at household and community level by capacity development, promoting collective action, 
working with women and men within households, communities, working from the bottom up or inclusive upgrading, working with companies to analyze risks, gender sensitive due diligence, through gender sensitive uh, due diligence, assessing business potential and actual impacts on human rights related to gender. Purpose is foster accountability in the private sector, often seen as part of a company's corporate social responsibility, practicing the core part of enterprise risk management. Specific areas related to gender responsive due diligence include rights and safety, work, land, and freedom of association. So, uh, what we hope, more efforts are still required to ensure that gender equity is mainstreamed and impact investment decisions. However, the field of gender lens investing is evolving, expanding, and adapting as because as leaders around the world are seeking to incorporate gender lens of finance to get better out outcomes. Thank you, everyone. Happy Women's Day. Thank you very much, Nasreen, Dr. Sultana. Thank you. As the final speaker of today, I would like to introduce a dear colleague of mine, Ms. Sonia Timmer. Sonia Timmer is a project manager of the CFC since the last five years. She's a finance ex expert, and she brings a wealth of experience from the commercial banking sector, having worked for the Rabobank Group, uh, but also from the investment banking division at the BNP Paribas, focusing on structuring international credits and trade finance facilities. Sonia has a strong interest in impact investments uh, that target businesses in developing countries and also nurtures a desire to make sure that there is a positive contribution to meet the social economic needs in these regions. Sonia volunteers as a board member in a microfinance foundation that is dedicated to women empowerment in Asia. She is also, or has also served as a committee member in an incubator program uh, supported by the Dutch government um, for agribusinesses across eight different African countries. So with this, Sonia, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I will try also to share my screen. So give me one minute. I hope you can all see it. We can see it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, yeah, true pressure to present today at International Women's Day CFC's uh, approach towards gender lens investing and how we as CFC are trying to uh, catalyze for change in, uh, in commodity value value chains. Um, a lot has been said already and, and gender lens or gender smart investment has uh, gained momentum during the last years, especially in the impact uh, investment world. But even though uh, funds and investment with gender lenses uh, are growing, um, the amount invested actually in gender sensitivity is still low. So um, for today, I would yeah, like to share more how we as C are trying to kind of break this bias <laughs> in line with the theme of today's International Women's Day by our investments in uh, local businesses and, uh, and funds. Um, a lot has been said by Ms. just by Mrs. Nasrim about uh, gender lens investing and, and what it is. Maybe to shortly indeed summarize and also to emphasize that um, the GIN, it's a Global Impact Investor Network, is an important network organization. And we at CFC are also following their approach as much as possible uh, their uh, definition and, and impact and metrics. So these, um, they are focus on two broad categories. First of all, investing with the intent to address gender issues and to promote gender equity. And secondly, as just has been shared, uh, by, mainstreaming uh, by mainstreaming gender in investment uh, decisions. So how, um, what, what is C CFC's uh, approach today and how are we uh, promoting gender lens uh, investing? Um, there are two major uh, components as part of our strategy today. And first of all, the first one is, is really focused, of course, on increasing access to capital for women. 
So um, we have actually, especially in the last one, two years, we've put a lot of emphasis and focus in encouraging and finding also um, female-led enterprises to apply for, uh, for CFC uh, financing, for example. We have also been promoting um, female-led uh, projects among our met network, um, also highlighting the successes and things that still need to, need to be done. Currently, maybe interesting to know, and I will tell you more about that um, in the next slide, but currently about 20% of what we have done in our project uh, portfolio um, is in, in female-led um, en enterprises, which is low, but it's, I can say it's, it's quite high as compared to um, to the industry and not, not just in developing countries, but even, I'm, I'm Dutch myself, even in developed countries, these numbers are way lower. Um, so there's still a lot to be, to be done, um, but yeah, we, we, we have at least succeeded to, um, to have 20% female-led uh, enterprises. Second aspect, and that is very important well, as well, is um, the workplace equity uh, for, for women. So this is really about equal opportunities and rights for male and female by investing in companies that are actively addressing gender-related issues, yes, both in their a strategy in our policies and promoting a culture that extends actually beyond just counting um, the women in the, in the workplace. So as CFC, we have actively actually works on also the social parameters of our due diligence when supporting uh, projects. So think about, for example, policies, um, but also not just policies, because finally it's also about actions. So during our due diligence, we would look really into uh, all the kind of policies the company says, but we would even, for example, interview uh, em employees to make sure that we're really committing to uh, the change makers in, in the industry and that are compliant. And there may be gaps, but then if there are gaps, we're trying to encourage and find those uh, type of uh, entrepreneurs and projects that are committed to achieving uh, gender related uh, goals. Um, another aspect um, is about, of course, um, we also need to understand, we need to monitor um, the impact in the indicators and, and, be, and be ambitious. So what have we um, achieved so, so far? Um, as most of you may know, CFC has five core uh, SDGs and SDG five is um, as, as gender equality is one of our core uh, core SDGs. We have also started to measure um, impact indicators for, for the last, last couple of years. And when looking at our current uh, projects or portfolio, we are supporting 32,000 uh, female, female farmers. To put this in perspective, this is about 52% of our whole portfolio in, in 2020. Now, when you look at another important um, metric, I would say for us, important objective, it's about generating, it's about generating jobs. Um, our investments are currently, uh, in 2020, we're supporting over 450 jobs which is about 30% of the, of the total. Well, when you look at the casual jobs, and this is what you typically see a lot um, in agricultural value chain, uh, we are supporting about 2000, which is about 70% uh, of, um, of the total jobs, uh, seasonal and temporary jobs that we are, we are um, supporting through our projects. So I will also try to illustrate later on an example, because this is typically what you see in the, the value chains that are active, that the different, there are different roles for men um, and women along the value chain. So uh, not just on the end of the farmers, but also in terms of the jobs and even in terms of, I would say, the, 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 the enterprises and who manages these, uh, these enterprises. We have introduced, um, new indicators in 2021 that are fully dedicated to, I would say, female leadership. Um, so we're trying to even focus more on women ownership 
on uh, female and senior management and also on um, boards, uh, female board uh, members. Um, currently, as I said, about 20% yeah, of um, our existing project portfolio is dedicated to support female-led enterprises. We, um, when you look at indeed agribusinesses, we are currently supporting five out of the total, uh, plus actually also one fund, Eco Enterprises, mostly active in, in Latin America, that is led by, by females. So formally we have actually six, six projects. And when looking at the agribusinesses uh, only, um, we, um, what we see here, and that, that is what they all have, have in common, these businesses are both owned, managed, but were also founded by, uh, by female. And especially the fact because a lot of them are quite young. Uh, and given the fact there's more, more emphasis, this is a very important uh, aspect that we need to make capital available also for the relatively younger um, uh, younger younger businesses to yeah to make sure that we can really uh, dedicate um, uh, more towards female uh, female empowerment and female female leadership. Um, and the, um, to foster uh, gender gender equality, I just shortly highlighted the fact that it's not just about it's it's about increasing access to to capital. It's about creating um, the workplace uh, equity for, for women. So this is an important part of our due diligence. And we're also actually working even with some of these female-led enterprises to even better integrate just policies and actions into, uh, into their business model. And we also tend to increasingly focus, and it's a, it's kind of, it's a relatively new, a new pillar um, in, the, in the industry, on specifically on products and uh, services that benefit uh, women. Maybe to give you um, give you an example um, on the one on top, it's a company um, we are supporting. It's called, it's called Shalem Investments. Um, it's led by a female, a very impressive female founder um, and CEO, um, and they are uh, they used to be a trader uh, in Kenya, mostly trading sorghum. They had a very wide network working with over 20,000 farmers, mostly female, 70% uh, female. Um, but they were very vulnerable uh, to, uh, especially to also to climate change, to droughts, uh, for example. But at the same time, there was a lot of malnutrition uh, in the area. Well, she was working with lots of uh, thousands of uh, female, female farmers. So with, actually with our financing, with CFC financing, um, she invested into, um, a new plants, machinery and equipment to produce nutritious porridge and, and flour, specifically also targeting actually um, the female in, uh, that are supplying to, to, to her and their communities. And this is, uh, she's currently reaching over 40 to 50,000, especially female, that do not only have access to more nutritious food, but they actually also have a better income and more control, because that's what it's often about. It's about having control over your, uh, over your payments, or over your, your income. Um, I would also I would like to um, show another example of a more recent in, um, project that was supported by uh, by the CFC. It's a company called uh, Exotic EPZ, and they're actually the only female-owned uh, macadamia presser, presser in, in Kenya. And to also just to illustrate um, the value chain, because this is very, very important, especially when you look at um, agri commodity value chains in, in developing countries, there are certain uh, patterns and roles and responsibilities uh, among male and, and, and female. Now macadamia, I don't know if you know, uh, it's a nuts, it's a really a niche, uh, a niche product, but it's grown almost fully by uh, smallholder farmers. In, in Kenya, Kenya is the third, the third the biggest, the biggest uh, uh, grower, uh, producer, and exporter of macadamia nuts. But they're almost fully grown by smallholders, of which, and that is very interesting, uh, 30% is is female. Well, this 
um, may seem low, and it is actually very low, because when you look um, in Kenya, according to the World Bank, about 70% of all farms in Kenya are actually run by female. So the question is, how come that in their value chain, um, the share of female is so low? Um, well, this has to do with the fact that, especially over the latest years, um, Macadamia has become a very lucrative, uh, lucrative crop. There's a lot of demand. It's a, it's a growing, an attractive commodity. So usually, when um, a commodity is becoming more attractive, it's finally in the hands of male, uh, male again. So um, this is where exotic, um, as only female-led enterprise uh, in Kenya, tries to make uh, to make to make a difference. Now, if you go to the second, uh, so normally if yeah, the farmers are growing the crops, um, usually they, they are selling the macadamia nuts to agents to that collect uh, that collect the crop during during harvest season. And interestingly, it's not just in macadamia, but it's in a lot of value chains. These agents are typically almost almost um, men, um, and that's where, of course, price negotiations are taking uh, taking place. Now, um, female in, in, uh, are usually, uh, especially in, in macadamia nuts, they are typically um, have low paid jobs sorting and, and, and they have all kinds of sorting and grading tasks at, at processing se uh, factories. While those factories are in the end, if you look at Kenya, for example, there are over 25 exporters of macadamia nuts, but only one, Exotic is the only one uh, that started a couple of years ago only, um, that is owned by, by female. These are the three ladies <laughs> managing, um, managing the, the company. Um, so yeah, I think by, by nature, by itself, uh, in a male-dominated uh, sector, they're trying to, to break this bias. And what's extremely important, and that's where we stepped in actually with two other, uh, two other impact investors, is uh, to, yeah to make their business a success in them they, they make funding uh, we provide um and not only trade uh, trade trade finance uh, but also they have plans to set up a new plant very close to the farmers based on a very inclusive model and um yeah we we yeah we have been we are currently um negotiating the last uh, parts of this uh, this this um uh, important funding um, and all the plans that they're about to, uh, to make. And uh, yeah, what makes them, and I will uh, um, highlight more about how they are trying to address the, the ba barriers in transforming with the sector, because it's not just um, at the fact that they are owned by, by female um, and they can of course mostly control their own plan, but they're also really trying to, um, uh, to to try to make to change the value uh, value chain where 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 possible. Now, what is what is exactly uh, their their approach? And as just highlighted by um, by by also by Nesrin from 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 Kids, um, there is um, this this three uh, layer tool uh, that uh, that can be used as a tool for so social uh, change. And um, apart from, first of all, you need to look at the, the, the reach. So what uh, Exotic is trying uh, to achieve is to increase uh, at the farmer level and production level from 30 to 45% female in the next, uh, next few, uh, few years. Um, in addition to that, what they're trying to do on the aggregation side is to appoint and propose, promote more female extension agents. Um, I mean, you cannot change the value chain, but you can, for example, employ people yourself that are reaching out or collecting from the farmers. Um, and it makes it often also easier for a female to work and uh, supply to other, uh, to other female to kind of break, uh, break, break this bias. Now, in the plant itself, they are already, because we also did our, uh, our due diligence, um, yeah, they have, they have strong policies, but also in practice, they're very um, they are focused on, I would say, diversity and gender, gender equality. 
And it's not only the management that are it's fully managed by FEMA, but also they have a strong governance structure, which is extremely important, with at least yeah fifty percent of the people in and senior senior management, and these actually are um, independent uh, board uh, board members that we not do we do not always see that in enterprises that have only started a couple of years ago. Um, Now, no, of course, the question is, um, so how are they gonna, how do they want to uh, achieve, uh, achieve this, uh, this, this growth? Finally, the second layer is just to complain this, you should think beyond the reach. Um, and also think about how you, how it will benefit uh, the benefit women. Now, what they want to do is they want to help female farmers to become more uh, commercial and, and more innovative. Um, they are, and that, that is, I, I think, uh, relatively also unique maybe in, in Kenya, but they are very much uh, focused on promoting financial inclusion by working with um, financial services, service providers. And about, for example, 90% of the payments made to the farmers is through uh, electronic payments. So once you enter into a contract with a female uh, that has its own bank accounts, where you directly as a company make this payment to the female, uh, female's bank account, it means that they will basically have more control um, over their financing and finally also over their uh, decisions how to spend the, their money. On the other hand, they're also trying to promote and they have given some, some examples uh, to support the farmers in, for example, very simply acquiring more motorized de-huskers de to hasten the de-husking uh, process and to make them uh, to increase uh, productivity um, after, uh, after, after harvest. So this is all, um, yeah, this is all finally yeah, to benefit them in terms of especially in terms of, of if in income growth. Uh, on the end, I would say the upper end of the value chain, um, Exotic is doing a lot uh, to create yeah, a, a workplace equity. And so they're offering, uh, they're doing more than what you would normally see, which is required by law in terms of maternity, workplace safety, equal opportunities. And what is I think quite unique is that they're, for example, also providing uh, affordable high childcare services. The third layer um, to uh, is is to make sure that um, that there's finally. Uh, a real transformation. It's also sh about uh, shifting the, the power uh, relations. So this is what is what they what you may have heard before. This is about uh, empowerment. Um, and so really about overcoming the barriers of entries related to to the social norms. And we really feel this. Yeah, this is something. As CFC, we cannot directly play a role in it. We really need to rely on our partners and how. Um, to make this this trans uh, transformation, um, so and the way exotic approach is about encouraging again this female entrepreneurship and to really make sure that the female have control over their spendings, over their cash, and that they enter into a contract with them. Um, and because of all the electronic payments, that they can fully control it uh, them themselves. There are, and, and that's and that's a more um, that's a more challenging aspect typically of value chains in these countries because even though female are um, maybe your counterparts, um, they are still lacking access, for example, to finance because the, oh, the land is not owned uh, by uh, by them, and the, the title of the land is often owned by either their husbands, maybe someone else in the, in the family. Um, and because of that, they cannot own cooperatives uh, themselves. Um, because of that, it's very difficult to get access to, uh, to get access to loans. And this is exactly where uh, companies like Exotic could, could step in because of the, their relation, because of all the um, 
yeah, the new developments in, uh, let's call it the digitization uh, age and also electronic payments, um, over 90%, maybe even more of all payments they make currently to their farmers is, um, is, um, yeah, is by, by bank and are fully tracing also that through, um, through an app uh, based system. So we can actually even monitor a CFC, they can share their farmer reports and we know exactly, they know exactly what has been paid to which, uh, to which farmer. So um, yeah, this is, uh, this, this is uh, one example, I think of a, of a role model of a, of, a, of a kind of a game changer in the industry. Of course, it's 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 not an easy road, eh? and it, we really feel it should come from from inside uh, inside out. But yeah, by supporting these type of of, of companies, um, yeah, we hope and um, feel we can we can make a, a change as as an in investor. Um, yeah, driven on on partnerships with um, with companies like uh, like Exotic. Um, yeah, to conclude, um, said, yeah, um, Jenna quotes, it's an important pillar of our investment uh, growth. Um, there has a lot been, been done um, in terms of, for example, measuring the out, uh, uh, outreach, but that should not be an objective on its own. So we are really also working and also still um, ourselves trying to better understand and to know how women can actually benefit and how we can make uh, this shift and transformation of power relations in the sector and overcoming these uh, these barriers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sonia, for sharing these insights about the CFC work. This really puts uh, the important topic into practice. So thank you for this. Um, Distinguished guests and speakers, this is all the time we have for today and we will have to conclude. Uh, since we are not able to have any Q&A in the interest of time, I want to emphasize though that the doors to the CFC uh, are always open. So for any follow-up thoughts or questions, always feel free to contact us. Um, we, before, um, yes, so, uh, I would like to hand back the floor to the managing director of the CFC for any final uh, remarks. So, Ambassador Bilal, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we apologize deeply uh, for the uh, for going beyond our limit, and this is only natural because of our outputting of our enthusiasm, our appetite our hunger, our aspiration to do more for this, because no matter how much we do, it is not going to be enough. Gender equality is kind of an, uh, is the pillar to which all, almost all the 17 SDGs rest on. So we are pleased to say that here in the CFC, in our small way, we have already made it as our one of our core SDGs long before. And now we are also working to make uh, gender, uh, sorry, climate action as also our core SDGs. And this is a process in going on. And I, before I conclude, I just like to thank all our speakers, mostly our keynote speaker, Ambassador Abba Fatima, for all your time, for all your passions to be here with us, and also to Ms. Nassim Sultana for taking the time. I know that I'm not sure where are you participating from, but uh, we are really happy to see that and can reassure you that gender lens is something we take with utmost serious. Our goal is to create a microsome of an, a model that the markets can scale up. And as you have heard from my colleague Sonia, that exotic is an example of what we are trying to do, how we can create some uh, model for the market that can scale it up. But we need your support. We need your enthusiasm so that we can scale it up. That's why we are going to launch our next uh, 
fund, uh, you know, raising event, which is our commodity impact embedment facility. And there we are trying to draw some private funds so that we can scale it up and we can do more for this all kind of core SDGs. But before we let you go, I like to assure you that all of you who are present here that uh, we wish to nurture a culture in the CFC where every woman should be able to use her voice and pursue her potential. As we work for alleviation of poverty, we used to practice a norm where a woman or a man should all work together to take down the barriers and end the biases that still hold women back. We reaffirm our commitment to listen to and gain insight from others in this journey to make our organization better and stronger. We'll continue to review our role on how we can play a more catalytic role in economic empowerment on women. Before I conclude, I would like to make a confession. When I began my day, almost every day, aspiring for a cute smile from her, when I offer her a glass of warm water with a pieces of lemon in it, this is her luxury. I'm happy to indulge and oblige. As soon as her smile fades, as she sips into the lemonade, I started to think about other women. The women who might have worked and put up with the tricky tone to make those lemons into the Netherlands. Maybe she is in Brazil or Bolivia or Bangladesh. I think how we could with our work in the CFC may help her to get little more extra income next year so that she can lift herself from the pit of poverty. When you take care of women, you take care of home, a community and eventually a nation. This is why this day is so important Let's work every day to make this happen. Let's celebrate International Women's Day 2022. We thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bilal. So thank you all for joining. This means that the meeting is adjourned. Have a good day.